So with Tech Command the Space Knight, um, you know, we made a, a series that was successfully, you know, was out there. And I began to get, well, other studios came to me with other stuff. And I remember Fist of the North Star, uh, I was presented with some of those shows and said, Mr. Winkler, would you like to produce that? And I took one look at it, and it was so violent and so sadistic. I said, oh, you know, I had to do all these things in order to get Tekka Man on the air. How the hell am I going to get Fist of the North Star on the air? There was no way that I could... I mean, it was just really over the top. So at the, you have to understand, at that time, that's what it was for, for, tele, for kids' television. So I passed on it. Interestingly enough, years later, the studio came back to me, and then I, I did it. I made six movies of that exact property that I turned down. You know, another interesting story was with, with Ultraman. We were going to do something. Uh, Adam West had, my dad had done legal work for Adam West, the television Batman. And uh, I had an idea to take an Ultraman television series, and it was a show called Ultraman 80, and to have Adam as sort of the American star. And in the show, there was this spaceship that would orbit Earth. And so we would rebuild that set, have Adam the captain of the ship, as aliens would come to Earth, or things would happen on Earth, or monsters would attack, Adam would report back down to headquarters to Earth saying, there's an alien, or there's a this, or there's a monster attacking, go do it, and he'd keep an eye on it. He was sort of like what Raymond Burr was in Godzilla, how they inserted Raymond Burr into the original Japanese Godzilla movie. So Adam wanted to do it, and we were really communicating with Subaraya to do that. And to make a long story short, it didn't happen. But it was before the Power Rangers, okay? It was sort of a similar type of a concept. And uh, years later at NBC, I saw Adam West, and he says, Billy, because the Power Rangers had already come out, it was a big hit. He said, Billy, they stole your Power Rangers idea. <laughs> it wasn't Power Rangers. Interestingly enough, here's another funny thing. Saban went, wanted to do... Ultraman, originally. It wasn't about Super Sentai or Power Ranger type characters. It was only when Tsuburaya said no that he wound up doing the second choice, which was to take the other Japanese property and turn it into what ultimately became Power Rangers. Strange. Isn't it funny how that works? There were other projects that I worked on. Uh, I was pitching a lot of kids' shows at the time to NBC and ABC. We came very close with certain projects. Paul Zastupnevich uh, was the Irwin Allen's uh, designer, and, and he'd come up with these big presentations, and we ha he made presentations for pilots that I'd originate, that I'd come up with, and we would be pitching them to networks, and he'd say to me, my God, it's like, you're like Irwin Allen re reincarnated, <laughs> you know, when we'd pitch. And I had toy companies. We were working with toy companies to develop a property called Johnny Lightning based on toy cars, famous die-cast metal toy cars. They were sort of like Hot Wheel cars. And uh, we were developing a series, had a series optioned. Uh, I then later developed a comic book toy line with a company, and then there were some issues with that, which I won't go into now. But anyway, um, so I was developing things as well as doing original productions. And uh, I then wound up doing more anime. But before I did that, uh, I wound up working with a company called Galaxy Online, which was like the sci-fi channel and the Discovery Channel on the internet. And David Gerald from Star Trek was part of it. Dorothy Fontana was part of it. Uh, Harlan Ellison had commentaries uh, for the company that he'd shot. Um, ben Bova was part of it. And anyway, you had and Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols. And it was very exciting. I was developing projects and handling all the celebrities and uh, putting together all these things. And then when the dot-com bubble burst, Galaxy burst as well. But at that time, I discovered uh, digital video and how you could make films that would look like 35 millimeter film. So I actually began producing my original films in addition to later doing more anime work. 
one of the first films I did when I left Galaxy Online, I had this crazy idea called the Double D Avenger. And it was a spoof of Wonder Woman about a costume superwoman who uses her super uses her super great big boobs <laughs> to fight crime. Now there was no nudity in it, no profanity, no real blood and guts. There was no it was not an X-rated film in any way, shape, or form, but it was a campy, stupid, idiotic comedy. And I got Russ Meyer's famous big stars, Kitten Natividad, Haji, and Raven Delacroix to star in this movie. Now, these women had been famous in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. They had big, giant breasts, and they were doing these campy movies that Russ Meyer made. Russ Meyer was arguably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, independent filmmaker in America. He wrote, produced, directed, he shot his own movies, made millions, was hugely successful, but that was his gimmick. Big, busty ladies that were over-the-top, camp comedy, larger-than-life movies, okay? And so I kind of took that formula, but did a spoof of Wonder Woman. And I got three of his famous stars to come back. Kitten Natividad was in Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Haji was in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Faster Pussycat Kill Kill is one of the most famous cult films ever. And uh, Raven Delacroix, who was in Russ Meyer's Up, which was another crazy film. And so we made this movie. I had so much fun making the Double D Avenger. I loved making the Double D Avenger. I laughed through that whole thing. It was just so stupid. It was the most, it was like a Saturday Night Live sketch, but elongated to a film. Forrest J. Ackerman uh, from Famous Monsters of Film Land was in it, and he played a wax museum caretaker in the Movie Land Wax Museum in the Chamber of Horrors. We shot, that was one of the locations, fantastic location. They had a set of Boris Karloff as Frankenstein in the Frankenstein set. Then they had Bela Lugosi as Dracula in the Dracula set. And they had Lon Chaney Jr. as the werewolf in, in the werewolf set. That, the sets, if you'd never been to the Movie Land Wax Museum, it's no longer there, sadly. It was in Buena Park. It was the most magnificent place. Those Wax figures were perfect. The sets were elaborate, like real movie sets. Beautiful lighting. So there's Forrest Ackerman, Mr. Monster Movie Sci-Fi himself, and then I've got the Russ Meyer stars there, and we're doing this crazy thing. It was absolutely fantastic. Now, when we drove down to the Movie Land Wax Museum, I'll tell you this one funny story. Uh, Forrest Ackerman had a home that was like a museum for memorabilia. It was called the Acker Mansion. And so the kitten and Haji and I went in and uh, Forrest gave him a tour of the place, including his bedroom. And he had quite a number of photos in his bedroom displayed on the walls of ladies in their birthday suits. <laughs> and before anything beyond the bounds of respectability could happen, I quickly ushered Forry and Kitten uh, into the car to go to the wax museum because uh, we didn't have time for any sort of extracurricular activities up there. <laughs> but uh, knowing Kitten, but uh, I love Kitten. But anyway, um, the Double D Avenger uh, did very well on DVD and on VHS tape. And there was a second release here. Joe Bob Briggs, the famous uh, drive-in movie critic, he was the host of Monster Vision. Joe Bob Briggs did a version where he did a comical audio commentary, poking fun at me and the movie and the whole thing and the stars. And we licensed it to Europe. There's a French language version of the Double D Avenger. We licensed it to Japan. There's a Japanese language version of the Double D Avenger. This stupid Z-grade low-budget, idiotic comedy, which is just a happy pill. It's just a funny little farce. Did very well. And it still does very well. And I'm shocked at how well it does. And it goes on and on. And we license stuff. I just licensed the rights to a big toy company uh, to do action vinyl action figures of the Double D Avenger. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on and on. From that, I did a film, totally the opposite now, called Frankenstein vs. the Creature from Blood Cove. Now, that was a 
homage to the Universal Studios monster movies and creature features, um, shot in black and white. I had a story idea of what would happen if the Frankenstein monster met sort of the creature from the Black Lagoon, and they had a battle under the waves in the ocean with the, you know, lightning going and thunder crashing and whatnot. And uh, from that idea, I, I wrote a story, wrote a, wrote a script. And from my acting money and from Double D profits and such, I was able to finance another William Winkler production. And Frankenstein vs. the Creature had marvelous special effects makeup. And uh, Matthias Schubert, my cinematographer editor, did an incredible, incredible job. And we had little fun cameos. Raven Delacroix came back and played a gypsy woman. Butch Patrick from the Munsters uh, played a, a werewolf when he was transforming back into his human form after having been shot. I needed a sleazy drunk in this bar, this seaside bar. And uh, it was sort of like a, a bikini dancing bar in a way. And, and so I wound up having Ron Jeremy, the infamous Ron Jeremy, uh, appear in a cameo in the thing as well. <clears throat> David Gerald was also in it from Star Trek in, as an office uh, writer, it, you know. And I played a, a big part, and it I was a way, another way for me to exercise my acting uh, skills. I played a part in Double D Avenger as Chastity Knot's cousin, and then I played Bill Grant, this this cheesecake photographer who stumbled upon this mad scientist resurrecting these monsters, and we were trapped. We were held hostage in the story. And so, anyway, Frankenstein vs. the Creature won Best Feature Film at the World Horror Convention, and it continues to sell to this day, and it did very well and overseas. And there were uh, model kits made of the creature and other stuff. So it was uh, soundtracks by Lakeshore Records, which was the biggest Hollywood soundtrack company. It was quite amazing. You know, whenever there's these big Hollywood movies with Brad Pitt or whatever, usually Lakeshore's the, the label that releases the soundtrack. And they loved Mel Lewis's music in Frankenstein vs. the Creature. So we had that going. But uh, those were some of the movies that I originally created, and then we went into even more anime after that. Toei Animation, Toei Animation, which was a huge company, came to me and wanted me to make um, compilation feature films in English of a lot of their properties. And so um, they'd been doing this for years. It was a Japanese idea to take successful television series and make compilation feature films out of them, usually comprised of four or five episodes or whatever that would link together and tell a story beginning, middle, and end. So we started with Guy King. Now, Guy King was about uh, this giant robot who would defend Earth from aliens attacking Earth. It was very unique because there was a spaceship called the Space Dragon, and at the front of the Space Dragon was this skull head of this dragon the skull would separate from the dragon body when it had to be activated, and arms and legs would attach to it, and the skull part was the trunk or body of Guy King, and Guy King's head would come out of it. It was a very famous toy. Mattel Toys made Guy King die-cast toys, released them here in the United States, and also made a big, giant, two-foot-tall plastic toy of Guy King. Guy King was a famous classic Japanese robot toy. I even had it when I was a kid, you know. And uh, so it was thrilling to make Guy King. We made three movies. I did the voice of Sanchiro, who was the pilot of Guy King, you know. And uh, those, those uh, movies were released in Japan, and they were also released here by Shout Factory, released them on DVD. Then after... After Guy King, we did a property called Dan Gardace. Dan Gardace was about uh, Earth was running out of resources, so they were going to colonize other planets, and there was this spaceship that was going to go out. But protecting the spaceship was a transforming robot called Dan Gardace, and it would protect the ship and battle this villain uh, named uh, Doppler, I think his name was, I remember. And... Uh, Anyway, uh, Dan Gardis was like a spaceship that would transform into a super robot. And uh, anyway, 
it had been a famous, like Guy King, it had been a famous uh, Mattel toy, a die cast metal toy, and uh, they were sold all over America. And also, he was a comic book character. Marvel Comics had a comic book line called Shogun Warriors, and Dan Gard Ace was one of the starring characters that Marvel had licensed. So when you saw the comic book series, Stan Lee presents the Shogun Warriors, Dan Gard Ace was like the star. I made three Dan Gard Ace films based on that character, based on the original Japanese character. And I did some voices in that. I played Captain Dan, who was kind of a deeper voice, you know, and, and uh, he was masked. And uh, he was the father of the pilot of Dan Gardes. And then I also played a villain using a German accent. There was this guy who was sort of an Aryan-looking guy with blonde hair, you know, and he was a German accent. You know, my mother's German, so I can pick up accents. I've got a whole bunch of accents I do, but anyway... The German accent worked beautifully for the uh, for this kind of villainous character, who also redeemed himself at the end before he was shot to death. You know. Anyway, after that, we did a series called Starzinger. There were three shows in America. It had been previously dubbed uh, and shown in syndication. It was called Space Cateers. Basically, you had three androids who were like the three musketeers and you know, in space. In the original idea, it was sort of like Journey to the West. Journey to the West was a famous Chinese story about a monkey and a sea demon and a, and a pig character that would travel with escorting a princess or a prince. Anyway, in our show, you had these kind of androids with those characteristics of monkey, pig, and sea uh, demon uh, taking this cosmic princess on a journey. And uh, I remember I did the voice of Sir Jogo, who was sort of the sea demon character, android. But he was very nerdy. He was kind of a very, he had a calculator and everything. So he was very forward in the mouth. He kind of used this sort of a voice, you know. He was quite uh, interesting. Well, Princess, I, I, I don't know exactly. It was that type of thing. Um, that was another really famous classic title. Then Toei came to me and said, we'd like you to do... Fist of the North Star. <laughs> and I remember, that's the one that I thought was too over the top. But you see, by this time, television had completely changed. We have 10 million channels. We have all the internet channels. We have the streaming and downloading, blah, 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 blah. So I wasn't in that straitjacket anymore that I was in when we did Tech-A-Man. You know, Peggy Sharon and Action for Children's Television and the Network Standards and Practice, all that stuff was kind of wasn't gone, but it, it was not, I didn't have to worry about it, okay? Because these things would have been DVD and streaming and cable or whatever. So I left all the violence in, and we, these were authentic English dubs of Fist of the North Star. We did six of them, six feature films. And for that one, I did the voice of Kenshiro, but he was very much of kind of a Clint Eastwood. It was very down here. And he didn't talk much. It wasn't much talking. But then when he would fight, he would go way up and... Da, 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 you know, this type of thing. It was like Bruce Lee type. It was sort of like a cross between Bruce Lee and, and Road Warrior is what it was. I mean, obviously, that was that, that's what the influence was for Fist of the North Star. So, anyway... Um, we did six of those, and um, I started getting s certain celebrity friends of mine that I knew to do voices, and I remember Chase Masterson did some voices in that, and she was in uh, Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine and, and some of those Star Trek shows. Um, oh, and in Starzinger, I had Anne Lockhart do some voices in that. Uh, in Guy King, I had Robert Axelrod, who was the voice of Finster and Lord Zed in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I had different people doing voices and such. Um, but Fist of the North Star is a very famous, again, classic title. Before that, we did two films of Space Pirate Captain Harlock, another famous title. And uh, I remember... Uh, you know, it was 
they went to a pi- they went to a, a cowboy planet in one of the movies. I remember it was like it was weird. It was science fiction, but the pirate was on this planet with like cowboys and stuff. So I know Larry Butler, who did a lot of voices for me, went into his whole cowboy type of, you know, he was doing this sort of, you know, rough and tough cowboy character. And, uh, but it was very interesting. I did Harlock, um, you know, it was, I would do voices that would fit my range. And, um, and Harlock was, it, it, again, it worked because our original Harlock show that we did, we did the original one with the evil alien Mazone. These were these sort of, sort of plant women. Um, he was very young looking. I mean, the guy looked like he was 20 years old. I mean, when you looked at his face, it was crazy, but he wasn't. But I mean, it was a very young guy. Um, there was a lady... A, a wonderful actress, British actress in Frankenstein versus the Creature, named Alison Lees Taylor, and I had her play the Queen of the Mazone. And uh, all the Mazone women had British accents, and I thought that was an interesting touch, you know, that they were alien and they all had this British accent thing. And uh, I remember David Gerald played the part of the president, who was a complete idiot. I mean, the character of the president was a you know, they were obviously making some sort of social commentary about, you know, bureaucracies. But anyway, um, so we did Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Again, I, these were like all the famous classic titles, you know. Following that, we did something called Kataro's Graveyard Gang. Now, that was one of my favorites. And Kitaro was a yokai monster. It was a Japanese legendary... Uh, there's all these Japanese legendary monsters called yokai, okay? Goblins, ghouls, whatever. And uh, Kitaro was sort of like a zombie boy, you know? And I played some ghoul, and, and uh, I remember I used Jonathan Harris's voice. Jonathan Harris was a good friend of mine. I'll tell you a little bit about that, but... Um, he had this type of a voice, you see? He was quite an interesting character, you know, um, I had Butch Patrick come in and do a voice of one of the ghouls. And, but you see, what's interesting about that one was I had a little more freedom with the script. And I could incorporate Adam's Family and Munster's type humor into this thing. It was like an Adam's Family or Munster's anime. It was almost, I, I think that was the absolutely perfect. I think the English dubbing of that was just phenomenal. And I think the the jokes worked, and it was... Everybody who saw it, or saw clips, said, my God, that's the best one we've ever done. We did two of those films. And, um, you know, after that, I also did some girls' anime shows. We did something called The Adventures of Naja. And uh, for that one, it was very interesting. We, we started singing. In other words, Naja sang songs in the anime episodes in, Eng in Japanese. We were given karaoke tracks, and I had to be a songwriter and suddenly write the English lyrics that would rhyme to these songs. And I remember one of the uh, authors of the songs, this girl said, why are you, your lyrics, Mr. Winkler, are a little different than our Japanese. I said, well, I have to make them rhyme. The ideas are the same. It's authentic and faithful to what you, authentic and faithful to what you wrote, but I have to make the lyrics rhyme. That's why the words are a little different. And then she says, well, why, why do American music lyrics have to rhyme? <laughs> and I said, don't they in Japanese? And she said, no, not all the time. <laughs> anyway, so we, we did that. It turned out great, you know. Mel Lewis, who did the music in Frankenstein versus the Creature, also did certain music. There was something with Fist of the North Star where somehow we didn't have the instrumental music with instrumental melodies for the opening themes and ending themes of that. Or there was something with rights, or I can't remember. We had to create that again. So when you listen to it, it sounds, it's note for note, it is exactly the Fist of the North Star opening theme and ending theme, instrumental music with instrumental melodies. But we did it. We had to redo 
we had to create the, the soundtracks. So then we began doing the music, and the music was great. For music and singing, we have a separate dubbing session for that, as if we're cutting a record, a record album. And uh, I remember the girl who did the voice of Nadja was fantastic, and wonderful singer, too. We did something similar um, with Lun Lun the Flower Girl. That was another one we did. Now, that was one of the silliest things that, that I did. It was... She was looking for a magical flower and had a boyfriend who would show up and give her flower seeds to plant and she had a talking dog and a cat. It was clearly a little girl's thing. And uh, But I remember we had to redo the opening theme and ending theme for that too. And we couldn't even use the original song. For some reason, Toei says, come up with something original, which we did. So we tried to do something similar in a similar vein, but we couldn't use the original opening and ending theme. The, the, the background music in the shows were the same. But, uh, and then I did pilots. I did pilots for Digimon, and I did pilots for uh, Pretty Cure 5. And those turned out great, you know. Pretty Cure 5 was sort of like a Power Rangers with girls. And, um, and then the uh, Digimon is very famous. We did one called Digimon Fusion Battles. Uh, there's a story to that, and I'll just, I'll, I'll make it very quick. Um, I made some really, what I thought were fantastic pilots for Digimon, okay? Really great pilots. And the casting was, I, Larry Butler played this villain named Mad Leoman, who was just, you know, he went, I mean, you know, he really fulfilled the part. The guy playing the leads, the kids were great. Um, I did the voice of a robot called Ballistamon or something, yeah. And uh, the goal was we were to produce the series. William Winkler Productions made those pilots so that William... So we, so we did these pilots for Digimon, and they were successful with the test audiences and were played at trade shows. And then a little while later, they wound up on American television, but William Winkler Productions was not dubbing them as we had expected to do, because we made these sensational pilots. That's show business, right? So we just moved on to the next thing, which was, uh, by the way, I will say that when I, I did, out of curiosity, I looked at the show that was not done by us. In fact, I saw some of the pilots that we dubbed, and then when it went to series, I thought it was the most abysmal <laughs> dubbing I'd ever heard. When Larry Butler played this mad Leoman character, remember, he fulfilled the part. Or, you know, he went crazy. And he made this grand entrance, I remember. And then I saw the scene of the final dub, and it was just so meek and mild and no energy. I thought, oh, my God, you know. So, again, that's show business, right? Occasionally you get the rug pulled out from under you. Uh, <clears throat> did many, many other shows after that. I mean, we, we did some things that were uh, uh, motion comics. This was a very interesting thing. They would take manga. Manga is Japanese for comic book. They would take comic books, and they would scan them in computers, and they would do pan and scan and, and cut out the backgrounds. They'd colorize it, and you could actually animate limited animation using comic book material as a source art. It was called motion comics. <clears throat> we recorded a whole bunch of those. I remember Kyoto Karasuma, Kyoto Karasuma or something. There was one of them. It was like, it was like an X-Files type thing. Some woman was a investigation in, investigator, FBI type thing, investigating weird stuff like, like X-Files. Uh, there was another one called Otogi Suji, which was like, sort of like Kitaro, all sorts of demons and gods of Japan. There was another one uh, we did called Mystical Detective Loki, which I always thought was sort of a Harry Potterish type thing that we did. But I don't know. I think if you're going to do anime, I love anime, fully animated anime. And if you're going to do motion, if you're going to have manga, it should just be a book, I think. I don't know. I don't know how well motion comics at the end of the day worked. I guess there's an audience for them. 
Um, I, and I just, again, all this work just continues. You know, we've done so much more. Uh, lots of other anime. I, I, <clears throat> I did pilots for uh, Prepara, which is called Prism Paradise. Prism, not prison. That was singing again, right? <clears throat> Basically, the plot to that was girls get these magical tickets and get to go to this sort of American Idol, Willy Wonka type place. It's like a combination of Willy Wonka meets American Idol. And the girls sang. So I had wonderful voice actresses who came in. Again, I had to write the lyrics to the songs. <clears throat> and we recorded. The girls had to be excellent Hollywood act voice actresses, but also professional pop singers. And every one of them did that. And uh, those pilots were, were great, you know.